I uh, did not mean to offend. Uh, while we are in the Western Conference, do we want to talk about Grizzlies Timberwolves? Now I feel like this is going to be a dangerous conversation to have. Uh, no. Thank you for, again for listening to another. Of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just want to make sure. Oh, uh, <clears throat> this is an interesting series. This is a series that features a lot of young talent. Why? Why am I already getting the face? I am too. No, I'm excited. This is a fun series. Like this is this is probably the Western Conference series I'm looking forward to the most. It's probably second behind Sixers Raptors. This is going to be a fun series. I'm gonna let you go because my number one question kind of talks about it. But this is what you want to see in the playoffs. Yeah, I I'm excited, man. You get Jaw. You get D'Angelo Russell. You get. Anthony Edwards, and you have Jaron Jackson Jr., and you have Cat and Desmond Bain. It's just, just a lot of young talent. And, like, I love the attitude of these two teams as well. Like, I think that's what really makes this fun. Like, there is some stylistic stuff that we're going to get into, but these are two teams headlined by young talent that genuinely do not give a crap about who you are or what your credentials are. They will get after it. They will get in your face. They will win, and then they will let you and your fan base and their fan base's mothers know about it. And it's a lot of fun. From Memphis's side, this Wait, pause. Like, okay. Before you go into your deep dive, I was going to ask my question real quick. Okay. Why does it feel like both of these teams are extremely confident and happy to see each other? I was trying to tie into that. I knew you would go there, so I had that there. <laughs> Because I feel like both of these teams have something they feel like they can really pick at. And I think that's where it starts for me. I think looking, just zooming out on Ja Morant, as incredible as he's been, we've had the what do you do with Ja conversation throughout the season because of how good he's been. And I think between drop, between switches, between showing two to the ball against him, like obviously there are more coverages that go into pick and rolls. But like if we zoom out those three basic ones, like sending two might be the one that he hasn't been great at facing this season. And that's Minnesota's base. But for Memphis, oh, go ahead. PG Steve is back, folks. He's done it again. My next question was Is this a series where the Wolves' aggressive defensive scheme pays off, or should they mix coverages? <laughs> That's uh, that's some good stuff. That's some really good stuff. But that's going to be such a fun thing to watch unfold. Because I think that's the one coverage that's, again, like nothing has stopped Ja this year. But like that's the one that's made it be like, okay, he's had some iffy possessions here. Like sometimes he's gotten the ball out early. Sometimes he's driven past the trap. Sometimes he's tried to string it out. And the size against him bothers him a little bit. Like it's just been one of those things for him this season. And so I want to see, like, how that goes from Minnesota's standpoint. And from Memphis's standpoint, um, going back to their last meeting, how – where are they placing Jaron Jackson Jr.? Uh, my overall point is going to be, like, this is going to be the Jaron series, I feel like. Or it's going to need to be the Jaron series for Memphis. Um, but just offensively, where are they placing him? Because Jaws the headliner versus, like, this big wing, this is a series in which you can put Patrick Beverly on Jaws. And that allow that takes Jared Vanderbilt off of those kind of assignments. And that allows Jared Vanderbilt to fly around the back line. In the last matchup, Jared Vanderbilt got the Jaron matchup. And with Jaron in the corner, if John was able to get that pass to Steven Adams or who he was running pick and roll with, Jaron can kind of be that back. I mean, uh, Jared Vanderbilt can kind of be that back line guy to rotate the test shot. If he's one pass away, now we're looking at D'Angelo Russell or Anthony Edwards as kind of the low man there. And that's where you get Steven Adams finishing over the top. And so that's where I'm just like, okay, where are we placing Jaron there? Um, Because I think that's going to dictate a lot of how successful this two to the ball system can be for Minnesota. I don't think they would put two to the ball if Jaron was the screener. Unless he's, unless he's the five. I'd see it as a switch or an under. I think Vanderbilt is on Jaron Jackson Jr. to take away some of the quote-unquote unicorn stuff. Hmm. 
yeah, you can shoot, you can drive, you can finish. I'm going to try and work to take away your drive. Now you got to make shots or you got to finish over me. Mm -hmm. I think that's the mindset. I don't know that Minnesota would just jump to two on the ball every time he screens. And even if they do, I think you'd have Cat helping. Because Adams wouldn't be spaced out. He'd be at the dunker probably. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's kind of the – the mix of it. Now you mentioned a good point here with Ja and two on the ball. He's had to take these reps. He's shown growth, but I think the overall mindset is, hey, we're going to get the ball out of your hands. We feel very confident in our ability to help and recover, and we're going to give you a dose of this over and over again to not let you lead the dance in that way. Mm-hmm. And that part is what's going to be interesting about it because you have – Patrick Beverly and or Anthony Edwards pressuring, depending on who Minnesota decides to go with. They can mix it up if they need to. And then they can show bodies on those drives. So even if it's not pick and roll, that's where I'm also intrigued. How many bodies are going to show in the lane when Jaw tries to go to work one-on-one, if that's the counter? Mm-hmm. Can they find a roll threat with Adams? Because I think the first time they played in Memphis, I think Adams was out and Jaron Jackson Jr. was setting screens as the five, and they were still just helping rotate and recovering. So can they consistently do that? Does that make Dylan Brooks and Desmond Bain just that much more important? Because you know what Jock can do against drop. You know what Jock can do against switches. We've seen him grow against unders. Can you do two on the ball over and over again for an entire series? Because while I think there's advantages, I think it's their success to it. I think Minnesota is really good at it. You're still handing an automatic rotation. Mm -hmm. And all they have to do is find one action that exploits it. Mm -hmm. And if that's your base that you're leaning on to hope to tilt this series or win this series and they they crack it, they break it, that's really hard to come back from in a playoff series. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of the playoffs. Because you might have a coverage that works for three games. But if they break it in that fourth and that's all you got in the cupboard. <laughs> this is it. I'm telling you, man. Now you got to go back to drop. Now what? Oh, now they're doing what they want to do. Oh, okay. Now we got a whole different series. So that's <laughs> that's something I'm, I'm interested in. But I, I, I think it opens the door for Minnesota. I think this is a fun series for both teams. My next question, who's, who is defense more important to in this series, Memphis or Minnesota? I think it is going to be more important for – man, that's a good question. Because, like, my first thought was going to be Minnesota. That's what I do. That's why I do these things. Both these teams thrive off getting stops. Both of them look different when they're active defensively. Both are aggressive with help. Both get deflections. They like to get out and run off stops and turnovers. They're likely to both show bodies to John Cat. Who needs it more? Oh, man, that's good stuff. Um, I think think the answer is still Minnesota for me. Uh, I was going back and forth because, like, man, like a lot of Memphis' offensive success is them pushing in transition more than anybody. And if they can't get stopped, they ain't going to be able to do that. But for Minnesota, like, I think it's very important because, again, they do have this aggressive base, and they have shown struggles when targeting to drop, like, full time or having to make that adjustment. And I don't know how switchy this team can be with the guys that need to play a bunch of minutes. And so, like, I think for them, like, it's important for their base really to hold serve. Because if for Memphis – like, I think they're good at a bunch of different things. Like, that's also the value of having Jaron Jackson Jr. Like, they can go drop with him. They can go switch off if they want to with Jaron at the five. If something doesn't work, like, they have they have more counters to their base than Minnesota does. So, I think it's more important for Minnesota to nail whatever they're going to try to do. It's It's a tough one for me just because of – the importance of Memphis forcing turnovers and running and scoring to keep them out of the half court consistently. But the same can be said for Minnesota. 
And so I see a world, I think it's tougher for Minnesota to sustain what they do if they can't get it done on the defensive end than Memphis. I think Memphis will still fight and try and find a way. I think we've seen Minnesota get, how do I say this sensitively or properly? This should be good. We've seen them get punched in the face and then kind of hold their face for a little bit hmm. in some of these games against some of these teams. Where all of a sudden the defense isn't holding up. Now you're not scoring. Now you're mad. And now you're down 15. Huh. I don't think that would happen in this series, but if I had to choose one of the two teams that needs their defense to show up, I don't know if Minnesota wants to make this a straight offensive slugfest with Memphis. Yeah, they don't want to do that because we've seen like the first half of the year when their offense was bad, a lot of that was because like it was turnovers and they just did not have the three ball going for them at the beginning of the year. And because of the shooters that they have, like they have a lot of pull up guys, they have a lot of streaky guys. Like if the defense isn't there, like they are prone to these kind of streaks where they can't knock down stuff from the perimeter. And if you do that against Memphis, it's gonna be it, Final score, Memphis 120, Minnesota 91. Like, we would just see that if things go off the rails in Minnesota. Um, and I, and back, to, back to your jaw, too, on the ball type thing. I think part of it is not just their base, but also just trying to keep Memphis out of rhythm more than anything else. If you know we're doing two on the ball and pick and roll, Maybe now you're trying to focus in on that. Maybe those possessions in the fourth where you all just kind of sit and do that over and over again, you get bogged down. Maybe we can kind of win that way. Maybe we throw some zone at you, throw some different looks. I'm not sure. Just thought. Go ahead. What was your question? Well, I have a different question now. Like, how much of a mix do you anticipate seeing from Minnesota defensively? I think it depends on personnel. I think two in the ball would be a jaw thing. I think – there will be nuance. I don't think, I mean, if they're smart, they'll be nuanced with it as far as knowing when to show it. You know, if he's not really coming off and we can get over or under, let's back up and recover and mix our, our looks that way. But if we can catch it, then, hey, two on the ball right there, mix it up that way it would probably be my best way to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to try and keep them off balance, keep them off rhythm and not give Memphis any automatics. So I think we'll see a decent blend. There's going to be some times where Cat's just not going to get all the way up there or he's going to be in a drop or Pat Bev's going to recover. So I think we'll see the mix. Mm. The question is, is the mix going to be because that's what they want to do or is the mix going to be because of something that Memphis has done? Okay, I got you. The personnel point is a good one because I think Jaw's going to see a couple bodies, at least to start, and then they kind of mix and match from there. We probably will see like drop and a guy going under against Tyus Jones. He shot well as of late, but I think you'll see the unders against Tyus. Or you'll see drop against Tyus. You'll see drop against so you'll see drop against Anthony Melton if he gets to run some pick and roll for him. You're gonna see drop against Bain, Maine, and uh Dylan Brooks. And that's where it gets interesting. Mm-hmm. Where are you putting Dylan Brooks in this series? Sorry, on the match I'm talking, I don't want to anger you. On the, on the court? On the court. No, that's a good answer. Yeah. But, what do you mean? I mean? Is he getting Anthony Edwards? Are you putting him with D'Angelo Russell? I put Dylan Brooks on Anthony Edwards. Playoff Dylan Brooks? Yeah, that guy wants to guard everybody. I got you. I'd be surprised if he was on Anthony Edwards. You put... Uh, Desmond on D'Angelo Russell and let y'all hang out with Pat Bev. All right. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, do you have an X factor off of the bench for either of these teams? An X factor off the bench? That's a nice cachet. I was that's a nice remix. All my X factors were starters. So huh. circle back with me. Who's your who's your <laughs> who's your bench X factor? <laughs> Oh, goodness. <clears throat> um, it's a couple in the front court. Like, I'm keeping an eye on Brandon Clark and or Kyle Anderson here. Because I do think... Oh, what's up? That Brandon Clark train won't stop, huh? <laughs> Don't do me like this. But I do think this is going to be a series in which Jaren's going to have to play some five. 
probably a good bit of five to close things out. And they're going to need one of Clark or Anderson, depending who's at the four, like, or if they play together, they're going to have to knock down shots too from the perimeter to help open things up. Because you don't want to give, especially if Minnesota's going to be playing aggressively and pick and roll, you don't want to also give them an easy help point and help them shrink the floor a little bit more behind that trap and just kind of dare Memphis to beat them with shots. And this kind of we went out to a part that we did what, a month or so ago about Memphis. Like, this is where I kind of go back and forth with the half-court offense because I feel like they run good things. They obviously have a fantastic headliner and jaw. I feel like they also play a lot of dudes that teams are like, okay, if he hits three threes, then we tip our cap. And they just have a few of those guys in the rotation. So it's like the shots are going to be there, but they also need to be there by design. So it'll be up to, again, Anderson or Clark to knock down those shots when given to them. I'm going to go Tyus Jones from Memphis. Okay. His ability to steady, his ability to make plays. If they don't give him the right coverages, he can play make, hit floaters, hit shots. He's got to be someone that plays for them. Who do you have for Minnesota? Uh, Malik Beasley's the easy one, but I kind of go Nas Reed here. Because I think he's going to be part of the mix when we're talking about with Minnesota defensively. Because some they've tried to send him, they, they tried to play him higher up in pick and roll this year. It does not look good most of the time. Like he is a good mover for a guy his size, but like that just does not seem to be the coverage for him. And a lot of some of their uglier breakdowns this year defensively has been him trying to get up to the level, just not being able to back pedal out of that or get attached to a guy after that. And so I wonder if they're going to continue to try to do that with him to keep the game plan consistent, or if he's in drop, like how deep is his drop? Because positioning there has been an issue for him as well. And maybe that opens up, you know, if they're playing drop with Nas Reed, he's super deep. Maybe that opens up the floaters for Tyus Jones when they're facing off these second units. And that gives Memphis some, uh, just some easy things to attack defensively. I'm going Jaden McDaniels. I just think they need his versatility. He'll help their their lineups as far as consistency with what they want to do from that kind of position. They they need his energy. Uh, bonus points to uh, Torian Prince and or Jalen Noel. One of them will win a game this series. Hmm. My uh, my bet would be on Noel between the two. My, wow. Tori, Torian Prince slander continues. <laughs> Wait a minute. One, it's not Torian Prince slander. Two, how does this continue? What was the first part of slander? Uh, go back to episode 58. I don't remember. <laughs> you can't just throw that out there. Wait a minute. Just, oh, yeah, you did it. It's fine. Oh, know. that's the that's the best part. Once you get past 70 episodes, I can just throw out a number out there. No one's going to go back. All right, episode four, I, yeah. <laughs> I feel like you are... <laughs> You say this, but you know that the dunkers will absolutely go back to this. Like, you know, I listen to the whole thing. Like, maybe something around the one hour 43 mark. Like, maybe that could have been perceived as a shot when Torian was in Cleveland. Like, no, 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 no. We have some very loyal listeners. I don't think you can pull that. There was film. <laughs> oh, of what man. you did. <laughs> I must say, I got a good laugh at, like, the cat quote <clears throat> came out. And I like quote tweeted the quote that I saw or the portion of the quote at very least that I saw. And I was just flooded with references from that video. I was like, you know what? I am never going to get past that. That is just, that's my peak Twitter existence, I guess. The, the, the My favorite part is you can hear the screenshot though. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, like I'm legit just driving around pu- like, just an on-brand thing, but just driving around the Target parking lot trying to go home, ranting about LaMarcus Aldridge lying about being a switch big. Like, it's... Oh, man. Do we see Aldridge in this net series? In the Celtics series? They may have to by default. Mm. Just if they can't do KD at the 5. Hey, man, last time they played, Goran Dragic switched on to Jason Tatum, and LaMarcus successfully depended on their drop. Congratulations. All right, man. Uh, qu- <laughs> all right. Quick question for you. Back to back to get the train right back on track. So we're just going to get this right back on track. All right. Uh, 
who has the edge between John Morant and Anthony Edwards? Um, edge in what way? Just in general? Yeah, I mean, like these these two are kind of feel like the motors of these two teams right now. In all due respect to Cat, the swagger, the leaders of the team. Who has the edge between them? Um, I feel like you're gonna throw the slander tag on this. Like, I feel like Anthony Edwards may have an easier time. Just because, again, like, I, I am anticipating Jaws going to see two bodies. Like, I don't think Anthony Edwards is going to get that. But I think by default, like, he would have an easier avenue to, like, dictate in terms offensively, if that makes sense. Like, Jaws obviously a better player, but that's also the point. The hashtag is Big Agenda. How? Kendrick Perkins on NBA Today had a segment between John Morant and Anthony Edwards. Uh, it said they were both generational talents. Uh, ja had the edge in swag and marketability. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anthony Edwards had the edge in social media game. They tied in athleticism. And Ja won in team. It was 4-3 to three in a five-category contest. Wait a minute. It was... Wait... I'm like the gif of the guy with the numbers pop and go, wait a minute, how is, wait, wait a minute, that's not how that's supposed to work. Um, also, if Ja won, how's this big, big agenda? Because you said they were tied in something. Did I say they were tied in something? Oh, you said Anthony Edwards have an easier time, but Ja was better. It's kind of what is that kind of a tie? I don't... <laughs> oh, wait a minute. The hashtag is bit asterisk. Wait a minute. I don't like <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, do you do you agree with the A list of players under pressure? No, I don't. No, I don't at all. And like I say this, I have not watched the segment. I have only seen what? the Why? Why? Why is are we thinking the same list? Like, why is Clay five? What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, why would he be on the? Oh, this is just another shot. No, because didn't uh the hashtag is big yeah, agenda so April thirteenth. Yeah. Kendrick go. Perkins. Oh, after seeing the A list, how in the hell does Clay Thompson have pressure? I'm just saying though. Dot dot dot. The best part is he tweeted that at 2.45 p.m. Central Standard Time. And Nikias uh, followed that up with, does Clay have the most pressure on his own team at 7.45 p.m.? Uh, the hashtag is Bing Agenda, even through the hours. Now, that was a pump fake into the real Big Agenda. And it worked to perfection. There are, like, layers. That y'all, you're on the, like, Spain pick and roll with the agenda now? Is that what this is? Yeah. This is disgusting content. If at first you don't succeed, <laughs> you can dust it off and try again. Dust yourself off and try again. Try, try again. again. Yeah, yeah, I got the, yeah. God. So this, this is the playoff big agenda. It's just going to be worse. I'm going to actually have to, like, I'm going to have to have, like, four different tabs open now. Well, it's, I guess six different tabs. So I'll have the NBA step. I have the NBA up. I'll have uh, cleaning the glass up. I'll have redacted up. Now I can. I have the film tab up as well. And now I'm going to have a separate one for like Kendrick Perkins' Twitter feed to make sure. Like, okay, when I talk about these teams, look out for any questions surrounding this, because it may lead into a big agenda. This is incredible. Thank you for adding more to my plate. Unbelievable. A pump fake into the real big agenda. This is. I feel like this is the proudest part of your pod prep. <laughs> oh, when I find one. Oh, man, I'm telling you, it's just like when you start drawing up plays and then you add more to it and then it works and you're like, oh, my goodness, I got one. Did you have any, <laughs> did you have any more actual Wolves Grizzlies thoughts? No, I, I, that's one of those series I want to see what it looks like. 
I want to see what it looks like. I want to see the energy. I want to see how they respond. Like, I want to see if Anthony Edwards does take the challenge against John Morant, or was that a regular season thing? You know, I want to see if they put two on the ball. I want to see if Minnesota is able to respond. I want to see the energy in Memphis, see the energy in Minnesota. This is going to be a fun series. I got seven games. I got Memphis in seven. Mm, okay. I, wow. Okay, this might be the series that we are furthest apart on. I had Memphis at five. Once again, picking against your Wolves. So you, uh, you, we did all this Wolves talk this year for you to not take this victory lap. I am very proud of the Wolves. Oh, you're not taking the victory lap away from me. I am very proud of what they did this year. You kind of picked against them in all the important moments. What you... <laughs> but this is the time where you just like quote tweet all the positive things you said about the Wolves and then log off for like four hours. Like I could do that, but like I wouldn't be being honest with myself. Like I was high on the That's Wolves. That's true. That's yeah, true. Like I... Like, that's the fun part of the Wolves season for me. Like, I was excited about them because of, like, basketball things. And so, like, when I see the Clippers matchup, it's like, okay, like, objectively, this doesn't seem like a great matchup for them. And they proved me wrong. Like, the, like we said earlier, like you said earlier, like, the Wolves, I mean, the Clippers did what they wanted to do against Cat, and it didn't matter because Anthony Edwards and D'Angelo Russell stepped up. And others, like Patrick Beverly made big plays as well. Also, I love Kevin Harlan. I do. Multiple references to Patrick Beverly being the most impactful Timberwolves player is a bit much for me. He wasn't wrong that night, though. I don't know about that. Patrick Beverly made plenty of big plays. He was very important to the win. Was he more impactful than Anthony Edwards was in that game? I don't know if I could go there. And like, I was what I mean, we were we doing the watch party. Like I was listening to the broadcast, and Kevin Harlan said it, and I was like, "Well, this is odd." Okay, okay, surely he just meant like most impactful defensive player, which I would still disagree with. I think it's Jared Vanderbilt, but I was like, "Okay, I see what he's getting to." But then he said it like four more times during the broadcast, like verbatim. And I'm just like, "No, so this is actually the this is the take." Like, this is actually what's being pushed onto the national audience. Hey, look, man, I have uh, zero time to be cursed out on an Instagram live at my age. <laughs> so I'm just going to back out of all this. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll take the L on that. Like, that's fine. I just. It is OK to say Patrick Beverly is important. Because, again, he did make plenty of big plays. Keep crucial stops, crucial stirrups, crucial rebounds, made big shots, the cap runs, was just a general irritant. Like, he objectively did a lot of good basketball things. Like, that can be true without it being he's the most impactful player on the Timberwolves. That's a bridge too far for me. And, like, if that gets me cursed out by Patrick Beverly, then I will just join the long list of people that have been cursed out by Patrick Beverly. Like, that is just fine. I will own that. I will be accountable for my actions. You know, I'm sure if someone wants to clip this portion of the pod, like that's it just kinda is what it is. But <laughs> like, hey man. Who do you who do you trust more in the fourth quarter, Memphis or Minnesota? Uh Memphis. And that's honestly what like the trust is where I lean Memphis in this series. All right. I'm gonna ask an annoying question. I said I was done. Is this a cat narrative series? I hope not. It shouldn't be. I actually had a cat-related question for you, too. But, like, it shouldn't be. Because, like, what happened during the playing game? Again, he was objectively not good in that game. Clippers had a lot to do with that, but, yeah. Clip, yeah, Clippers did have a lot to do with that. Like, the Clippers bothered him. Like, there were a couple of fouls that you could quibble about with Cat. So, like, I get him just being frustrated, period. He had a bad game. But I was having this conversation with someone earlier today. It's okay to just say Cat had a bad game. He did. He had a bad game. The Wolves won anyway. It can be that versus Cat shrinks in the moment. Cat can't control his emotions. Yada, yada, yada. Like, it doesn't have to devolve into that. No, I don't it like does, that. It doesn't. But 
a lot of this is gonna be a lot of time, a lot of people's first time seeing the Wolves for extended time. They may have read the greatest big man shooter of all time quote mm -hmm. and not wanted to say anything at the time, and this may be their moment. It's kind of how, how it works these days, which is weird to me. I just have a discussion and discourse and agree to disagree. Don't just like sit and wait. Ooh, I'm gonna wait three weeks and then oh, remember what you. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not fun. So no, I don't want it to be. And on the cat related front, is Steven Adams getting that matchup off rip? Or is Jaron getting that matchup off rip? Steven Adams. I think okay. Steven Adams for sure. Now how they use cat pick and pop or off screens may dictate a change, but I think Steven Adams gets it off top. Okay. Uh, I was just curious about that one because of the pick and pops in particular. Like that's going to be some strain on Stephen Adams to defend in space. It an awful level, but like the pick and pops for Cat in particular because they can be pretty deep. Like that could be something. Like maybe we just see like a pop where you have a third guy kind of stunting at him, to kind of disrupt the early shot, and then Cat. I mean, then Stephen Adams is kind of there from there. Like this is going to be. This can be a series that Cat just completely goes off. Because if Cat, I mean, if Steven Adams can't defend him in space, like the three's going to be there with those pick and pops if he gets that matchup. And the growth that Cat has shown as a driver this year, he's one of the best drivers in the sport at center. So there are avenues. And again, just going back to my earlier point, like I really do think this is going to be a big Jaron series. But I think this is going to be a series that he's going to have to close at the five. And he's going to be tasked with dealing with Cat. And he obviously has the mobility to do so, the length to do so. But he's going to have to stay on the court. This can't be a foul trouble series for him. Because if the front line becomes Steven Adams and Brandon Clark and Kyle Anderson and Xavier Tillman, Cat is going to be picking and popping to death. And once he gets the smaller guys on him, he's putting them, or at least attempting to put them underneath the basket. Like Brandon Clark just doesn't have the size for it. Cal Anderson doesn't have the size for it. And so Jaron is kind of the blend of the guy that can bother him with his length at the rim, but also has the mobility to kind of take away those pops too. Um, so with that, like I, I said, I went Memphis in five. Like they're just, I think their young guys are more equipped for this kind of series mentally. I don't think we'll see as many breakdowns from Memphis side as we could see against uh, from Memphis, uh, from Minnesota. And I don't know. I just kind of worry about the psyche. And that's kind of where I go with Memphis in this one. Great season for Minnesota. Very proud. The matchup zooming out, like I think they match up pretty well. But I do think Memphis is a little bit more battle-tested. I mean, they have fewer questions for me than I have with Minnesota, especially if the base defensively doesn't hold it. Makes sense. Valid, solid, great stuff. Are you and Pert going half on those courtside seats in Memphis? Or? 